lovely to see you all, and we are here to talk about the trouble with reality, a rumination on moral panic in our time, with Brooke Gladstone, our media watchdog. And you know, as I opened up this book and started reading it, I know you quibble with my description of this as a book, but we'll get there. <laughs> I, I suddenly thought, this is a book that's going to surprise people because, you know, we're all like awash in alternative realities and fake news, and here's this, our guide, our goddess of the media who can help us understand. But this is really not a book about partisan politics or partisan me media. I mean, not that it isn't that, too, but it's really about us. Uh, we're in the trouble with reality. This is about human psychology. It's about philosophy. It's about our, our kind of our weird minds. Yeah, it's uh, it's a lot about information processing and cognition and our intrinsic wiring. Why things are the way they are. If we stipulate that media, most of it is uh, a profit-making enterprise or constructed that way, then, uh, then it's really our responsibility for how it turns out. And it doesn't mean, when I, I wrote this uh, other book a number of years ago uh, called The Influencing Machine, which is kind of a 2,000 year history of the media. And, uh, but the ultimate final line was, we get the media we deserve. And people came up to me in high dudgeon and said, I don't deserve Rupert Murdoch. I'm not responsible for that. And you know, I was speaking collectively. I mean, and it's because we are like hamsters hitting for pellets, and we know what makes us feel good, and it isn't necessarily what's the most healthy. Um, so that there's that part of the book. But I also, you know, I just talk about why we build our own bespoke worlds uh, so specifically and guard them so jealously. Because when I was asked to do this book, the question was, this feels different. This feels different from just the election of a president that uh, we didn't really, you know, we might not like. I mean, you live long enough, you're bound to have a lot of presidents that you don't like. Uh, this seemed to be a deeper kind of distress in certain precincts of the nation, mostly urban precincts, the coasts and cities in red states, you know, that kind of thing, although red state, blue state is, we all know they're purpley. <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, Bruised. the point is, is I was trying to address that angst, and I realized that this had to do with not fear or anxiety about a particular individual, but a sense that certain ideas, foundational ideas on which you constructed your world, your reality, uh, they weren't true. They weren't what you thought they were. And so you had to pick up the pieces, and that's what caused the pain. Right. You, you, they kind of got, as you say, sucked into a black hole, like your vision of reality with the um, the election of Donald Trump. But I imagine that, you know, um, so that was a, a joyous occasion for conservatives. But I was thinking if you were conservative and you were wed to the status quo in the 60s, um, and then, you know, all this kind of stuff started happening, protesting the Vietnam War, um, marching in the streets, challenging kind of ideas about gender, or even like the, the way families should form, you probably felt pretty messed up as well. Right, but it isn't that you don't get your way. It's that you, what you believe to be true wasn't true about the place we live. I mean, the people who felt that the family was falling apart and we were losing our, our values and, and uh, you know, the kind of social agenda of, of many conservatives, not all of them, is, uh, you know, they still understand the world. They're not getting their way. You know, liberals don't always get their way. It's a question of, you know, how things function. What is important? What are the beliefs on which we base our reality? And there were certain ones that uh, turned out not to be true. You know, one of the principal ones being that facts won't change a person's mind. 
not facts alone, right. won't change a person's mind. What they seek is validation. And uh, if you want a fact to be accepted, you have to place it in the context of their world, their reality, their interests, not just say, yes, but this is wrong. Because uh, you know, increasingly, it's become almost a cliche. One can believe whatever one chooses and find 30,000 websites to support you. Right, so you have to convey, you have to communicate, in other words, and like, and understand different contexts in which you're talking. But we don't seem to like to do that. You say that like we don't really want to see each other anymore, and the media kind of reinforces this. We can't, it's painful. It's painful to have your view of the world challenged, to, you know, to have your universe fall apart like it did for more than half the country. Uh, you know, so why is it so painful? And why did it happen uh, on, a, on a kind of broader cognitive wiring level, not the, the niceties of, you know, political back and forth? And that was what I tried to ex explore. I wanted to find an explanation for how we feel. That wasn't just the usual, you know, people believed his lies. You know, I thought it was, I thought it was a lot more complicated than that. And, uh, and it wasn't about how we have to go and, you know, uh, share with someone who doesn't agree with us. I kept this very self-centered. <laughs> what does this have to do with you? What do you need to examine in yourself? I don't mean changing your mind or compromising your values or your principles or even your beliefs. I mean understand how you function. And that's sort of the beginning of understanding how this happened and you never expected it to. So, so you're suggesting that maybe all of us should go into analysis of sorts. No, no. <laughs> so that's no, I think hard. we should all go into fMRI machines. And uh, <laughs> no, it's, it's not, it isn't a complex that you can fix. It is a survival mechanism for the species that was developed at an earlier time that has less relevance today or less value but is still how we are constructed. And so I'm just laying out uh, the framework of how we are constructed and a bunch of places you can go if you want to know more about that. So let's talk a little bit more about what that, that thing is in us. How would you characterize it? Well, I bring up these ideas, a couple of concepts that I only learned when doing this, called the Umwelt and the Umbegang. <laughs> Repeat after me. Umwelt, Umbegang. But anyway, the thing is, is that in the natural world, the Umwelt, it, here, as a matter of fact, why screw it up when I could say it exactly? It's, uh, Umwelt expresses the idea that different animals living on the same patch of earth experience utterly disparate realities. And I quote neuroscientist David Eagleman, who wrote, in the blind and deaf world of the tick, the important signals are temperature and the odor of butyric acid. For the black knife ghost fish, it's electrical fields. For the echolocating bat, it's air compression waves. The smallest, the small subset of the world that an animal is able to detect is its umwelt. The bigger reality, whatever that might be, is the umbegang. So, uh, you know, so your dog experiences an entirely different world than you. And, uh, and, you know, if he knew how little you smelled, he'd feel bad for you. <laughs> so are you saying, I mean, I mean our, our dog doesn't want to take away our health care, for example. Yeah. <laughs> if your dog knew what that would do to you. Now, you are bringing it back to politics. And it's so many steps from how you see the world and how you believe it's constructed and why you think it's the way it is. Right 
to, uh, you know, to the niceties or not niceties of healthcare policy. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and yeah, there is a road there, but that's, that's probably beyond the scope. I mean, taking us down that road from here to there. Right. But, there but there are certain things that are interested. Our beliefs are linked in order to create uh, a coherent and durable reality. And so you've got you know, an interesting study uh, that an Australian, um, I'm not remembering his name right now, but that an Australian researcher did. He looked at a thousand uh, sites about climate change and started correlating the opinions of the people who went to these sites. Many, many, many people. Mm -hmm. And he found that the people who expressed the strongest belief in the free market, that was correlated with not believing in climate change. But it was also correlated with not believing HIV causes AIDS, and also correlated with not believing that smoking causes cancer. In other words, believe in the free market, the more passionately you believe in it, the less you're going to embrace science. Why? Because that would necessitate interference in the market in order to regulate. So, you know, I could do the same kind of extrapolation with healthcare. Your, our worlds are built on a web of beliefs. And uh, so, at some point, you connect the dots and you get to, you know, the situation we're in right now. Right. Well, it's interesting because, as you say, so it's a web, it's a network. Um, we, we exist in relationship to one another because of our differing, or through our differing beliefs, whether we see that or not. And, and you know, I guess we create webs so we don't have to see it as much as we might otherwise. Um, but, you know, there's also, so that's like individual, but then there's these kind of systemic things, right? So that, for example, we all have prejudices, but it's power that makes prejudice, so the ability to um, do something to another person, racism in a way, right? When you have the power to take your prejudice and make it a norm, then that's when that you're talking about racism. And I wonder what role power plays in all of these. Well, you can be racist and powerless. Right, right. I mean, but I mean, for it to be something that is systemic, that, mm -hmm. that functions in a society, you have to have that power to impose it. And yeah. I just, I, I guess I'm like, we all have our beliefs, but they wouldn't have that impact on us without power, I'm presuming. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I don't disagree with that. Uh, you know, but I guess where I am in the, in the book is examining the roots of these things. Like, uh, let's take prejudice, which is a kind of subset of stereotyping. Mm -hmm. And stereotyping, uh, the word was first used in the way we use it now in the 20s by this great media critic and newspaper man named Walter Lippmann. And he, uh, you know, he used it. He said that, you know, these are shortcuts, or sometimes people call them heuristics. You know, you've got... Uh, you're reading stuff. Your world is too big for you to, to really grasp. So you have to build a smaller, more comprehensible one and, and move in. And so you've got to simplify, simplify, simplify. And so, you know, we do that with stereotypes. You know, if we, if we know that someone is an international banker, we know how to feel about them. If we know that that person is a kindergarten teacher, we know something else. If they're from Brooklyn, we have an assumption. If they're from Baton Rouge, we have an assumption. And so on. It takes a word or two. And then you don't, and, and then you walk away. You say, OK, I think I know them. And uh, you know, when you talk about power, it means when you've got in, you know, p groups of people who are not the norm, or who haven't been established as the American norm, even though they very well may be and increasingly will be, people of color, you know, won't be much longer before that is the norm. And, you know, the, uh, you know, we're going to have to step off. But in any case, it's, uh, you know, if, it's, if those prejudices, those stereotypes are reinforced 
through the media, through the stories we tell ourselves, through the pictures that we choose, because we will buy them because they support our prejudices and our world remains coherent, uh, you know, that's when this mutates seamlessly right. to institutional racism. Right, and you, you um, uncover, I mean, by looking at it through this, through psychology, behavior, and that belief in that world that we created, even though it's just one tiny bit of the whole overall world, that in our commitment to that world is so powerful that we will, even when we're confronted with evidence that would suggest we are living in a lie, and we probably get confronted with that all day long, you know, every day, we find ways to kind of yeah. reject that. Oh, yeah. You know, we confirmation bias, outright denial. And, and this is not new. I mean, William James, the great pragmatist, wrote many years ago, he observed that we really, when faced with something that is undeniable, and we have to accept it, because if we don't, it won't serve our interests. What we do is we change as little of our belief system as possible to accommodate this new idea, leaving most of it whole. So it's just a little like stitch that happens, and, and that is what we do. And it's only when there's a huge smash up of, of universes that anyone might even consider examining the broader issues that undergird their belief system. And I, and I really think that, you know, it, we've been here before. We, we won't remember it. But certainly, uh, the lost generation between the big wars, between World War I and World War II, they had been lied to systematically by their government. Yeah. They had a belief in progress as a straight line. They had a belief that technology, technological change, was always good. They had a belief in America that, you know, in its wisdom that wasn't supported by the participation in that war. And it wasn't just America that felt that way. It was many countries in Europe as well. And uh, suddenly, uh, the whole system just smashed into pieces, and you had a whole generation that couldn't figure anything out. I mean, it was, they just decided there wasn't any point in believing anything at all. I mean, Dada was created then. Mm -hmm. and, they, and that was an explicit rejection of all the accumulated wisdom of the ages. Well, so we're having that smash up right now, as you said, or at least some of us are having that. And there's, the power thing comes back. You say that, um, or I think quoting Masha Guess, Gessen, you say that the aim of Trump's lies is to assert dominance over truth itself. Right. You know, the thing is, is that if you believe that you can't really know the truth, that there is no honest broker, then that gives you permission to make up your own mind on the basis of selective information or no information at all. And then, you know, the big fear is what does that do to democracy? And I noticed that you had uh, folded down Ned Reznikoff in here. Is it still folded down? Yeah. Ned Reznikoff said that this is the big fear. Conse he writes on Think Progress, very liberal website. Consensus is the bedrock of democracy. For differences to get resolved in a properly democratic fashion, there needs to be agreement, agreement over the terms of the debate. Interlocutors must be aware of their shared rights and responsibilities, and they need to be capable of proceeding from a common set of facts and premises. When political actors can't agree on basic facts and procedures, compromise and rule-bound argumentation are basically impossible. Politics reverts back to its natural state as a raw power struggle in which the weak are dominated by the strong. In other words, if you don't have a common pool of facts, you can't compromise, you can't negotiate, then it just becomes who can yell the loudest and who can you know, start you know, taking apart the protections that we have now that the founding fathers had put in 
to protect us from this particular moment, from, uh, from demagogues. They knew the possibility. They always talked about the possibility. Right. And, uh, and they didn't necessarily, all of them, think that democracy was going to save us. You know, they, some of them had pretty dim views of humanity. Uh, one might say realistic views of humanity. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but the fact is, is that they understood that no system is any better than the people who operate the levers of its power. And, uh, and they had to guard against the wrong operators. Um, so what are you seeing as someone who reports on the media every week, sometimes analyzing it, um, but sometimes just like drawing our attention to these interesting, you know, or like let's stop here, this term is being bandied about, you just did a show about sexual harassment, let's look at the actual history. There's a history to that term, to those words. So um, what are you seeing in the media and the way that it's covering the smash up that kind of supports, or you say, ah, I can see it happening there um, in the way they're operating. Well, you know, the problem with, the, with media in general, and, I, and I, I always worry about even using the word because less and less can we see this as a unitary institution. Sure. It is, you know. The medias. The, the, <laughs> you know, all the media out there, the media you choose to consume, the media you don't, the media that you don't want to admit you're consuming, the media that you, you know, that are guilty pleasures, uh, you know. It's, uh, there, there are all these different worlds now and they're reinforced by these megaphones and echo chambers or whatever metaphor you want to use. So, I would say that if you look at the mainstream media, a lot of the deals that were struck in mid 20th century America are kind of off a degree of deference and civility uh, are, are passing. I mean, I, I, we love to focus on words and on the media because they're wonderful little prisms through which you can see a bigger picture. And if you mm -hmm. consider the word lie, uh, you know, it was a huge issue when the New York Times used the word lie, right. which, uh, you know, and NPR doesn't. The reason why NPR doesn't is because it says, reasonably, a lie is deliberate. We don't know whether or not he just doesn't know. <laughs> but if you're Masha Gessen, you say, this is a program of destabilizing a belief right. in the truth. So whether or not he knows an individual lie doesn't matter. Uh, it's, it's the process. And then, you know, I think probably there was this, uh, this great book that was written a few years ago, God, what was the name of him? Uh, Henry Frankfurt, I think his name, and it was called On Bullshit. He was some yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, philosophy professor at Harvard, or somewhere. Harvard, or yeah, I think it was Harvard or Yale. In any case, you know, he he made a big distinction between a lie and bullshit. You know, a lie is you could argue that is what the Bush administration did in the run-up to the Iraqi invasion, insofar as that they believed something to be true, but they didn't have the evidence, so they cooked it, you know, weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. It wasn't true. It was lies. I mean, there, were, there, there was one or, watchdog organization that counted 93 critical lies presented by the Bush administration in the run-up to that invasion. But you're trying to tell a different story. You're selling a story. Bullshit is when you don't care whether it's true or not. It's just for the moment. You don't care if it's true. Maybe you don't know if it's true. You'll just assert what is ever useful in the moment. The truth or, or untruth of it is utterly irrelevant. And I think that's the situation that we're in right now. But getting back to the Times word, and I am so sorry I'm being very unradio like taking forever to answer these questions, but <laughs> I'll just say very quickly that the Times used it when Donald Trump said, well, uh, maybe the president was born in the United States after all. And, you know, the Times said something like overturning or rather, uh, you know, discounting the lie that he had maintained for X number of however long it was. And it was a big thing. 
because that was a departure. I think in some ways, the continuous attacks on the media have been somewhat liberating. But there is a cost. The cost is that the people who aren't sure either way will see this aggressive behavior as a reason to believe Trump that, that they're not telling the truth. Right. I when mean, in fact the reporting has been very, very good. Right, and leading into the election as well. Um, you know, I came across well, leading this. into the election after he got the nomination. Mm. Before that, the uh, reporting was appalling. It always is appalling, actually, uh, election coverage, yes. I think. True. We make the same complaints every single time, but this time the stakes were so high that uh, the usual quirks of the media were disastrous. Right. Well, I mean, this might just be my effort. I don't even know if actually it's grasping for straws, but trying to understand the longer history of this. Because I came across this article that Eric Alterman wrote, I think, in The Nation on the kind of anti-journalistic nature of the Bush administration. And in 2005, he wrote that, that they withheld information or deliberately released deceptive information regularly. They bribed journalists who they thought were friendly to report the news in a favorable context. They produced news reports and distributed it free of charge to broadcasters looking for content. And then they created and credited their own political activists as journalists, and these were people working for partisan operations. And he wrote, you know, some of these tactics have been used by previous administrations too. So again, it's an old story. But the Bush team and its supporters have invested in and deployed them to a degree that marks a categorical shift from the past. Well, I don't know what categorical means. It was worse than it has been for a while. I mean, not the worst than it's ever been. I mean, you know, you go back to the Civil War or go back to the nation's founding, you'll see some really, you know, stuff that would never be countenanced today. Um, but, uh, but you know, it was a partisan media in a way, right? Because there was the media had a stake in like, what's the country going to be and what the right path is and the wrong path. And right. You, from our vantage point, you think, well, that's not, you know, that's not like my <laughs> Right. Well, NPR I mean, like I said, a the... big difference happened in the middle of the last century, though it, had, you know, it wasn't just, it didn't turn on one day in 1950, but I mean, it was gradual, but there was a huge shift and it had to do with uh, building on changes that were early. Of course, you know, American newspapers were, like in many other places, originally owned by guilds and political parties. That's why you have newspapers with names like, you know, the Livingston Democrat Republican or something like that. It was, you know, there have been, uh, there is a reason why, you know, they were politically inflected and everybody knew it. And you would, you would take, as they used to say, more than one paper, you would take sometimes half a dozen. And uh, when the prices dropped, you know, when they, they were a little bit more expensive then, and then the, the prices dropped to a penny because they started using a new model based on advertising, mm -hmm. and they were all saying, we're objective, but they weren't objective. And then, uh, you know, and, and then it got cheaper and cheaper and cheaper, and so you had more and more and more of them. And then, for the first time in, in maybe history, the media, the dominant media, was more expensive than anything that ever happened before. Mm -hmm. And then you needed bigger audiences to support it than you ever needed before. You also had a, a limited, uh, distribution area, the airwaves, which the government uh, regulated. So you have television, it is incredibly expensive, so you've got that technology, you've got the problem with the business model, and then on top of it, you have an existential threat of nuclear annihilation. So all of these things create a middle that everybody signs on to. I'm not even saying, you know, they all got together in a room and did it. That just doesn't happen. Uh, at least not that I'm aware of, but a sense that, well, you had to make, you had to appeal to the government, you had to appeal to the sponsors, you had to appeal to a vast majority of middle and completely marginalize the outsiders. And that is the paradigm that we had with the rise of television and that has continued until the rise of the internet. And that changes 
the syntax, the grammar, the rules, and the, uh, you know, the rules of engagement. All of that, and the relationship, obviously, between the consumer and the producer of news. So that we're also seeing play out. Well, I want to come back and ask you mm -hmm. about fact v. fiction, but I want to open it up to you guys as well so you can get in a few questions um, before we wrap up the program. So um, we're going to bring some microphones around. There's a yeah. question right up here. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. So I was thinking about what you said about how dogs experience the world differently than humans, and I was imagining that if a dog was reading the New York Times and all the articles are written by cats, and the cats occasionally talked about moderate dogs, straight acting dogs, the talented tenth of dogs, and had very kind of paternalistic stories occasionally about dogs, but there were no stories that were actually written about dogs by dogs. We might occasionally see a token dog. I would think that that would be a reason dogs might completely give up on the mainstream media because they see it as merely being a cat-centric media. And so they might go on to blogs and things that we don't consider to be um, authoritative sources. So how do we get more dogs in the media and how do we get dogs to actually trust a cat-centered, cat-created media? Best question in of the festival. Okay. And, you know, all, all I can say is that there are tons of dogs out there that have started their own properties right now and have huge, rabid followings. <laughs> anyway. But, but the fact is that, uh, you know, what you're really asking is, where's the public square? Where can the dogs and cats talk to each other? And that is the question that is so confounding. Because, you know, back in the days of, like, the mid-century and further on, when you had everybody watching the same stuff, you know, you had lots of dogs watching cats. You know, you had Leave it to Beaver as the American norm. No one of color, no one who wasn't uh, white Anglo-Saxon Protestant, no one with an accent or a vowel at the end of the name. No one except these main people and also the newscasters, you know, speaking on, from on high. Same thing. So we were all watching it, we were all signing up, but they didn't represent us, but it was our common experience. So you have a little positive there. And, and negative, too. You had a standard of civility. We understood what was true and what was what and what wasn't, although sometimes it wasn't true, but we thought it was. But the problem is now we don't have a public square. We only have people talking to other people like themselves. And uh, so, yeah, maybe the cats uh, at the New York Times feel that they're you know, reaching out to the dogs, but the dogs don't feel that way. Um, from a, a personal point of view, I'll say this. Um, we, at one point a few years ago, we tried to talk about, you know, does NPR have a liberal bias? And we talked to Pew, they had a way of measuring this, and we talked to other people and this kind of thing. And uh, it was liberal, but not as liberal as the New York Times, and in fact, the Wall Street Journal's news pages, not its editorial page, was more liberal than the uh, than National Public Radio. And the Washington Post was more liberal also. So anyway, uh, so we were liberal-ish. But we, ha we did a thing with our uh, listeners where we asked conservative ones to listen for a week and tell us what their reactions were to uh, what they were hearing on public radio. And they were very frustrated by the choices of stories, by the uh, variety of voices. They felt they weren't being represented enough, although if you talk to other organizations, they say that basically liberal media overcompensates with more conservative voices, so there you go. But mostly it was the choices and the attitude, the assumption that listeners would feel the same way they did. And then, you know, I said, so why are you still listening? And they would say, it's really irritating, but the information is good. The information is true. The, the, uh, uh, the, idea, the ideological subtext really bugged them. But fundamentally, the information was not a lie. It was, it was true. It was just presented through a prism. 
but it wasn't inaccurate or even unfair. What it was was inflected. So, you know, getting, getting back to your question, I don't, I mean, we could have half the paper written by cats, say, you know, and half the paper written by dogs, uh, but you might as well have them written by algorithms because we all, every journalist has to bring some kind of frame in order to make the choices, in order to write stories, in order to choose them, in order to write them. And there are certain values and principles that, you know, people will regard as American or as shared, and maybe they're not because they shift. I mean, when I was writing the comic book, The Influencing Machine, I went back and looked at the balanced reporting of slavery that was done. And, and, and you know, so on. This is, uh, this is a moving target. It's a picture that keeps changing. And who's, who's in the front of that? The New York Times was ahead of a lot of the rest of the press when it came to thinking, you know, slavery wasn't so good, you know? And uh, the same thing with the internment of uh, Japanese citizens and, and so on. One could argue, you know, gay marriage, which seemed to happen so fast, was a... There's no way to do journal... Journalism is completely irrational in, as an enterprise. The Founding Fathers wanted them, wanted it to be a mission-oriented necessity for an informed electorate, but they didn't support it like a public service. It's a business. And, uh, and also, there is no single set of American values after all. That is something that we learned after this election. Yep. Um, yeah, I'm curious. It, it sounds like uh, your argument is that this is a, an individual problem being exacerbated by, uh, by the media, by institutions, by news timelines. Is there stuff that you're seeing at any level um, that is kind of bringing that common perspective back together? Anything that media does that has worked? Anything that tech companies have done that has worked or, or platforms or people? Uh, I think the problem, there's, there are attempts. There are things like, you know, you'll go to a, a good website, say the Times or the Post or, or Slate or something, and they have a point of view, but they'll say, here's what other people are saying, and they'll, you know, connect you to uh, a website that's good, but is in no way uh, harmonious with their general perspective, and, it, and that's an effort. But, un, but, you know, fundamentally, people have to want to do it, get other perspectives, figure out what other people are thinking. And, uh, and it's very easy, of course, for people to avoid it. I mean, if you want to limit your world to volleyball and gardening and never hear anything else, you can pretty much do that. And uh, I've always believed that the internet has made us more, makes each of us more of what we were going to be anyway. It's us squared, you know, or cubed or to the 10th power. And I don't know that anything can work because we're increasingly consuming different media. And it would have to be uh, an enterprise that was widely shared across platforms. So that's why the book, I come down to the individual in the end. And then people always say, well, you know, it's, it's only liberals that want to hear what the, uh, you know, what conservatives, are. conservatives never want to hear what liberals are saying. And conservatives might say, that's all we ever do is hear what liberals are saying. <laughs> So, um, you know, it's, it's, it's sickening to, to, to have to confront in a, in, an, in a way these views that are so threatening. You know, it just kind of makes you feel sick. Uh, so nobody really wants to do it. Let's try to get another question in before we wrap up. Oh, you, so I'm sure one. you um, yeah. read uh, The Image by Daniel Burstyn. And this was like 1964, 65. And he was warning exactly what was happening, what was going to happen 50 years later. 
He didn't actually, there was no reality TV, but he could have said there's going to be a reality television person going to be his president based on what was he saw happening with our relationship between reality and what we saw in it, at that time um, on television. I think the media's been very much a factor in this. How do you see the media I mean, play a role in our dealing with reality as it is? Well, I think the media is like a funhouse mirror. You know, it breaks up our culture into a bunch of little fragments, and we see a little tiny bit of it, and we stare at that part of it. And uh, we, I think the media serve us too well, gives us what we want too much. I, um, I wonder if, if the world, if there are no facts and everything is a fiction, kind of what you were saying, I mean, and you, in the book, you, you read Philip K. Dick, um, uh, Jonathan Swift, there's a lot of, I mean, I wonder, if the, this is a good time for the humanities, isn't it? If it's all fiction, maybe there's a different platform that we should be using. Uh, it's, uh, I'm not sure what you mean by that. <laughs> well, we had a, we had a, no, neither have I, but I'm just saying that, you know, you're, we're looking for facts, right? And the media is not helping us, you know, we're asking for something that it cannot give us, it only reflects us, but, Fiction, but, but literature is a space facts. where people yeah. do work things out. Where it we is. had a beautiful writer yesterday, Neil Ferris, who said, "Fiction, you can all solve all kinds of problems in fiction, and why the hell not? Because you're kind of creating a world where those those limits and constraints don't exist, and so it frees the imagination." Well, there's a huge there there's a huge value. I'm gonna I'm a total science fiction right. uh, freak. Is Nerdette here, by the way? I just wonder. Yay! Um, there's no death back there. But, uh, but the thing is, is that, um, and, and we've talked on the show about how visions of the apocalypse, you know, the post-apocalyptic world, post-drought or post-flood, you know, we, we talked to a bunch of great science fiction writers about that stuff and how you can work it out, how you can imagine things. I mean, there, there have been studies that have found that uh, science fiction writers are generally much better at predicting the future than professional futurists are, because futurists work within and extrapolate from what already exists, and uh, science fiction writers don't have to do that. So if miniaturization doesn't really already exist and you don't see a basis for it, then as a futurist, you're not going to imagine an extrapolation of it, you know, that kind of thing. And so, you know, going way, way back, you know, many, many things have been predicted and almost entirely by science fiction writers. So, yeah, it's really, really useful. But the fact is, is that there are, there is real, just because people say the news is fake doesn't mean, obviously, that it is. I mean, there are real facts. There are, there's data, there's numbers, there's, there is, uh, and there is a passion among, uh, good journalists to ensure that their work is as good as it can be and to uh, concede when they've made a mistake, as everybody does. Uh, it's, uh, that information is out there. You, you, you have to want it. And one interesting thing that's happened during this period is that uh, even though we all know that business models have broken so much in the last you know, 20 years or so, mm -hmm. uh, suddenly supporting quality journalism has become a kind of act of resistance. And so what you've got is many more people supporting the great American institutions like you know, the Washington Post and the New York Times and public radio. Many more people saying, well, I realize that these aren't going to exist if, if I, you know, that was always the case. But now they are stronger, they can do a better job. The biggest problem there is that there's not that glamour on the local level, and it is local reporting that has suffered the most. Right, right. Just before we let you go, um, and again, the book signing in the back, what, what thing did you used to believe in that you no longer can? Um, well, since when? <laughs> Uh, there are a couple of things. Certainly, one of the things I address in the, in the little book is about uh, the power of facts. 
I don't believe in that anymore. After my exploration, now I know why that doesn't, why that isn't true. Mm -hmm. uh, I believed that uh, the mechanisms of democracy, the structure of democracy, would ultimately, I believe that our democracy was so durable that it could withstand anything. I no longer believe that. Wow. Um, I, I've always, don't applaud that. I, know, I was going to say, I have to find a more positive note. But I mean, I, uh, <laughs> I, I'm terribly worried about uh, gerrymandering and the fact that twice, uh, you know, in a generation, less than a generation, the Electoral College has not matched the popular vote. Uh, you know, before that, I think it was 100 years before that had happened or some huge amount of time. Uh, I'm very concerned about uh, the fact that for uh, recently, anyway, the Congress and the presidency don't seem to be engaged in, you know, look, uh, Congress has always been a fundamentally political rather than democratic body to, to a, a large degree. And I'm certainly not saying that, you know, Democrats haven't engaged in some of this behavior. The thing is, is that in terms of gerrymandering, in the time that the Democrats have been out and the Republicans have been in, the precision which is generated by algorithms with which those can be drawn mm -hmm. is, is so much greater. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, maybe Democrats would have done the same thing, but they didn't because they didn't have the technology. Uh, I'm also worried that if Congress isn't working and the presidency isn't working and the, we've had the courts, but the courts are being packed now and we're so busy worrying about, uh, you know, what's the latest outrage that Mr. Trump flies and throws into the air, you know, about what talking to the wife of a, of a, a veteran, of a uh, soldier who died yes. or whatever the latest scandal is, you know, he fills the air with shiny objects and we keep taking our eye off of the, uh, of the real, real issue. So that worries me. Thank you so much for coming out. Thank you, Mr. Gladstone. Thank you. So and I wish we had more questions.